I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 2nd of November 2022, and this is my vlog of daily life in Nicaragua. I am recording in Ciudad Sandino, Managua today, and uh, but I'm recording in the future because I've been very behind, and I wanted excuses to get more time filming here because while I filmed here previously, I haven't filmed that much here, and it's a change of pace. And we have a lot of new viewers since I did any episodes here, so it just made sense to get some of this for, for newer viewers. Now, I do hope newer viewers are going and l watching old episodes as well, because that is a great way to catch up on the show and support the channel, which I really appreciate. So that's something to do. There's a lot of content back there, but it's unrealistic to think that very many of the new people have seen that far back and the very specific few episodes are there. So I'm trying to film some here for sure. Today, we are actually in Leon that the events of the day are taking place and it's a pretty busy day. Uh, partially because we're, we're still dealing with all the stuff. That's pretty much wrapping up. We have a pretty good handle on what's going on. Uh, it's starting to wind down a little bit, but today, uh, yesterday we went and looked at the second house. So the 31st on Monday, uh, we looked at the Fatima house again and we really liked it and everyone kind of agreed that it might be uh, a really good fit for us, even though it doesn't check a lot of our boxes, which is, a, so it's a weird situation. It doesn't check our boxes, but we still think it's gonna be a pretty good fit and we can make it work and it's got some really good space for the kids. Then we went and looked at a place yesterday in Sutiava and it checks all of our boxes, but we didn't feel it was gonna be quite as good a fit just because uh, of the style. And so we, we kind of all thought someone else was gonna lean to the one in Sutiava and we all kind of leaned to the one in Fatima. So last night we put in an offer on the house in Fatima and today we assumed we would hear back that they didn't accept our offer, but they were going to negotiate because we gave a reasonable offer. They were not asking a reasonable price, but that's how negotiations work. And so we're expecting that they will come back pretty close to our offer and be done because there are very few renters out there, very, very few that are looking to rent in that kind of price range. And we are clearly willing to pay a reasonable price for the market. Uh, in reality, we never heard back at all today. The real estate agent did respond to us a little bit, but we found out from her that she actually refused to talk to the uh, to the, the sellers of the house or the renters, uh, the people looking to rent it, um, because she had actually, and this is strange that she admitted this to us. She said, well, she went to them and told them that we were already going to take the house at a much higher price than we would ever have considered. And we're like, you did what now? And she's like, and, and I can't go back to them and tell them that that information was incorrect. And we're like, but so you went to them before we had even decided this is a house we wanted after we had originally said it doesn't check any of our boxes but then we said well we're still willing to look at it but it doesn't check our boxes and then apparently she went to them and said they haven't made an official offer yet but they're going to and here's the price they're going to make the offer at and a number that we would never have entertained ever um, never discussed in any way and that's what she told them and so they were expecting to be getting an offer at this high price and when we came back at a low price, she was like, well, I'm not going to tell them. So we told her she had to tell them, uh, and supposedly she did. But I have no reason to believe that she actually did. She made some excuse that the guy couldn't respond during the day because he had to n n talk to his son because he didn't make the decisions about his own house, which is plausible. But uh, who... Who in the real world is looking to rent their home or sell their home and takes a day not to respond and waits for other people to talk before you even acknowledge that you've gotten something? That's not going to happen. No one actually selling or renting a house would do that. So uh, we talked to uh, people who had connections and we got the actual number of the person selling the house and we contacted him as well. And he refused to ever respond to us. We know he read the messages because it's WhatsApp, but but he never responded at all either. So at the end of the day, we're pretty certain that the house was never actually for rent. Um, that is, that's our belief. We know we were told that uh, the desire was to sell it, but they knew that selling it was impossible, so they were willing to rent. 
My guess is that they wanted to sell. They were hoping to get a high price selling. They didn't know the house was being shown for rent and she was hoping to come back with a really high rental price, uh, play hardball with us because he would say no, come back and talk them into it because uh, because it wasn't actually for rent, but she knew that she couldn't sell it. That's my guess. And so when we contacted him for rent, he just blew us off. It was all very strange. And it's important to note, I had spoken to him in person. So I was not a random person contacting him. He knew who I was. Um, and I didn't make, make an offer or anything. I simply contacted him and said that we were afraid that our offer had not been put through to him. And so we were hoping to talk directly to ensure there was no miscommunications and he declined to clarify communications. That's a really big deal. That's a, that's a huge statement as to how much he was not willing to rent that house under any conditions. Because at that point, it doesn't matter. Even if they came back and negotiated, we weren't going to take the house. Like, that was a weird situation that we were very uncomfortable with very quickly. I was uncomfortable by mid-morning, but Paul and Dominica were like, no, no, don't just get upset at a bad process. But it was very clear that from the get-go, uh, this was falling apart um, and something fishy is going on. Now, exactly what fishy is going on, we don't know and we never will, but it brings up some really important points about a lot of real estate everywhere, but here in Nicaragua especially. Now, there are new laws coming into effect that should improve the situation a little bit, but that we don't know how much teeth they will have. We don't know exactly when they're gonna come into force and we don't know how much uh, people will be able to catch it. Because one of the problems with these kinds of things is it's very difficult to say what has not hasn't happened uh, in a lot of cases. Did they talk? Did they talk in earnest? Did they relay correct information? Um, did they relay complete information? Were they intending to sell? Were they intending not to sell? We don't know, right? So a lot of times there's things that happen that are unprofessional or unethical. And even if there's a law about it, what are you going to do? You can't necessarily prove it. But knowing how these things work and knowing what could happen is very important. Now, in this situation, so, so that's our topic for the day, is I want to talk about seller's agents, because we've talked a lot about buyer's agents and why they're dangerous and why, especially here, you need to be extremely wary of them. And and everyone will ask the same question, but isn't this one one that's okay? And, and I'll go, well, no. Anyone that you, and if you ask me about it, it is guaranteed, it is the absolute last person, I would say, to use as a buyer's agent, but it can, because in every case, the exception that people think they have is exactly who we think you're talking about, right? Like you, you have not found an exception, trust me. Um, and, and every person I know who does it, they all say, well, I think, you know, we talked and they seem, and then eventually they always come back and go, wow, you were right. I can't believe it that even this person, and it's like, well, that was the person we were talking about. And like, oh, we thought, we thought it must be someone else. It is not, it is the person you think. And, I, and it, there's lots of people, right? I'm not saying that there's one person. Don't be watching this and go, I think he's talking about me. I'm not talking about a specific person. I'm saying that no one has ever come to me with some surprise new person and it not be who they, you know, they always say, well, the person that must be the exception. No, no. And so don't come ask me, but what about this person? Or which one should I use? No, don't use one. And if you do, don't ask me which one because I've already told you. And if you say to me, which one should I? Do? Should I? No, it's a black and white thing. I don't know of any scenario where that rule doesn't apply here. So just be aware. Now, seller's agents are different. We haven't talked about them much. So when we're looking at seller's agents, sometimes you have to use them because they may, although this doesn't really exist right now, they may have exclusivity on a property. Now, legally, they may not have exclusivity, but practically they might, meaning that the uh, seller of a property may simply use them as an exclusive and, and honor that. Um, so whether it's a forced a contractual thing or simply the fact of how a house is being shown. It doesn't matter. A seller's agent may be a fact of life and that's fine. There's nothing particularly wrong with a seller's agent. Um, a seller's agent can be working for the seller and can be valuable. And I've worked with many and, um, and, and for the most part, uh, they've been okay. Right. Um, but they're not my representative. So they're not working in my interest. And I know they're not working in my interest. And we're all on the same page. Right. They say we represent the seller. I say I'm not the seller. We're all clear. Right. They're there to get maximum money from me. 
I'm there to try to get a good deal. I don't have a buyer's agent representing me. I have to represent myself. That's no problem. They're basically like the lawyer for the opposing side. That doesn't mean we have to be adversarial. We're trying to come to an agreement on something. That's absolutely fine. They can play a great role and find, you know, show houses, and they can even show me multiple houses, although you have to be wary of that. Remember that when seller's agents start showing you, well, I have other houses to show, be aware, they're not your representative. They have no necessary interest in showing you things that are appropriate for you. And if they have something that's perfect for you, that isn't gonna make them maximum money, they may hide it from you. They're allowed to do that. They're, they're supposed to do that. That is their job. So, uh, so just be aware that as a buyer, a seller's agent is a perfectly fine, legitimate thing in many cases, but they are not your agent. Don't forget that. They are the seller's agent. You are talking to the enemy in this case, the opposing contractual side. Uh, and that is absolutely critical to understanding your relationship with the seller's agent. Okay, now that we've established that, there's some additional problems that seller's agents may have. Um, one, as we found out here, they may relay incorrect information to the seller themselves. And this is for a lot of reasons, but they potentially have a lot of... Um, uh, value to the agent in manipulating the seller. And let's give some examples. If a seller may not be willing uh, to, to haggle to get a really good price, the seller's agent may decide to haggle on their behalf. And that may benefit them in the long run. So it, it, this is not the evilest thing. Um, but you may make an offer, say, I will buy this house for $100,000. And the sellers and the seller says, I just want to get out of this house at any cost. I'm going to take the first offer. $100,000, good, I'll take it. The seller's agent may say, I know we can get $150,000. And so refuse your offer of $100,000 without telling the seller or uh, by misinforming them or whatever. I'm going to do the video. I think it actually looks pretty good under here and it keeps me from getting way too hot in the sun and my foot is pretty sore so I'm trying not to walk around too much. So they may play a game of misinformation to the seller for the purpose of getting a better overall deal and many times it may work out because the seller is probably not as well informed as the seller's agent. So the seller's agent probably has more tools and is probably less emotional than the actual seller and can probably negotiate harder and get a better deal. So that may sound like a good thing. However, we now need to look at a few things that are different. Yes, the seller and the seller's agent are on the same side in general, but they're not 100% the same. A seller, we assume, has one property to sell, or at most a few, and they may be selling or renting, right? That's important that there's both. We'll talk about both things. And a seller's agent, we will assume, has multiple properties, or at very least more than the seller themselves. Uh, and basically, the seller makes their money off of the sale of a single uh, large item that they own. They have a one-time, yes, it could be two times, but we each transaction, it is a one-time deal. They have one large payoff that they are trying to negotiate. The agent on the other hand, only gets paid a transaction fee or a set fee, almost always a transaction fee, and that is across many properties and happens on a recurring basis. They do not have to go out and reinvest, buy a house to be able to sell it. They simply find someone who wants them to handle the transaction and get to work with the house. So a seller's agent, we assume, if they're doing well and at their job, is going to be able to have on a recurring basis many small transactions. Because of this, there's actually a misalignment potential between the seller and the seller's agent. That doesn't mean a seller's agent will take advantage of that, but it means if they're not doing exactly their diligent job, they could come out of alignment and do something that hurts the seller for their own gains, right? The seller's agent is going to be looking at their personal gains, not the not the seller's gains in all but the rarest of cases. And they're sure, they're, they're, maybe they're supposed to look at their customer's uh, objectives, but if they're paid to do something else, like anybody, if you're paid to do something other than the thing you said you're going to do, which, which talks louder, a promise or the, the money? And it is the person that you made the promise to that is paying, offering you more money to do something else. So think about it. Um, the uh, situation that may be occurring here, uh, the seller may be desperate to get out of the house, right? They need money for something and they need it right away. They don't need the maximum amount, but they need money quickly. In IT terms, this would be bandwidth versus latency. I don't care how much data I can push, but I need some of it right now. Um, that may be their priority. 
the agent, because they have many properties, may not have that same priority. They may say, oh no, I don't care when we sell it, as long as we sell it for the maximum money, I can wait because I have lots of smaller transactions that are absorbing my income, right? That is their income, that's their job. So they hopefully have a lot of things in the pipeline and it evens out over time. And so once they have enough to put food on the table, they want to do whatever it takes to maximize the total income from those properties, not get it earlier to some degree. If they're getting like, oh, $1 more, but I waited three months, yeah, you want it earlier. But if they're getting any significant amount of money more, they're generally willing to wait possibly years. They're not the ones sitting on a losing investment. They're only missing the time value of that money. And they're probably not waiting a really long time, just months, maybe years. But for a seller where that is their nest egg and they can't get access to it, and they're afraid that they may not have it or they may miss opportunities to use it, not having that right away may be a big deal. So seller's agents have a tendency to be more aggressive with negotiations because they are simply not in the dangerous position that a seller typically is and have lots of mitigating factors that make it very easy for them to hold on a long time to potentially maximize their money. They also have a hedge system. A seller has probably one house. If it never sells or they do something that sabotages that property or they hold on to it for a long time and its neighborhood goes bad or the property itself gets damaged, they lose potentially all their money, but probably just a big chunk of it. The seller's agent will probably lose that sale, but they're probably not going to be massively impacted because that was not their property. They have lots of properties turning over all the time. And by maximizing others, losing one may be a wash or even still beneficial to them. So they're not at risk in the same way that the seller is. Um, and they, they may not have the need to get paid right away. Now that's for sales. For rentals, we have another thing, and this one's much more significant. Those things, while all that is true for selling a house, it doesn't generally impact people very much. Very few sellers are like, oh yeah, no, to get, you can get a higher price, don't do that, don't hold out for that, just give me the low one now. Most of them would be like, oh no, I like where you're going, get me the more money, I would have just taken the lower deal. So normally that works out okay. With renters though, it's very different. In a rental, you have to look at the total income that a house can do over time. So let's say it's a 10 year period and it's gonna rent for $100 a month just to make all these numbers really easy. That would mean the house would make $1,200 a year or uh, um, $12,000 over the course of uh, 10 years if it rented every month at $100 to the rental agent. If they're gonna rent it once for 10 years, they're going to get, let's say they get a one month commission on that sale. They're gonna get $100. That is it. If they're only gonna get $100 when they rent that, um, they're not, one, super motivated to do anything just because the amount is low. But two, that renter, the actual person who owns the house is like, how do I get $12,000 out of this property? If the rental agent wants to get more money, they can't rent it more times. They can only get a higher price. But unlike a sale where the house makes nothing when it's waiting, it does lose some money, but it doesn't lose a lot. Uh, a rental that's empty loses a lot. So let's say that the rental agent decides they're going to rent it for 150 instead of uh, 100, but it takes them uh, five years before they find a customer. To the agent, they just made $150 instead of $100. They got a 50% increase by waiting longer. But the total amount of money that will be earned by the house over that 10 years will be only $9,000, not $12,000. So the, and the commission paid out to the real estate agent will be 150 instead of 100. So instead of 12,000 minus 100, it'll be 9,000 minus 150. The agent gets paid more for screwing over the homeowner in that case. Now, in some cases, yes, they may work that they both make more money, but that's awfully rare in general. And there's always the risk that that agent may have held out and never rented it because they went too high, or they may wait a really long time and then drop back to the original low price because they've got to get it rented. And then they still get their commission just the same. The seller or the renter is the one who gets screwed, having it empty all that time. And that's a risk of what just happened to us, right? The uh, the, the person who's actually renting the house may be looking for some money, whether it's a total amount or some right away. 
and they have one interest and the agent, and this is very clear, she was unwilling to pass on. So we know she's doing something de deceptive with both us and the seller. She wasn't gonna tell us that she didn't put in, eventually she did tell us, which is amazing that she was honest about that. Um, but it's weird to be like, I lied. So sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna represent the, the seller of this house. Um, but the, the seller lost a rental. Now, maybe they would have turned it down anyway, but not very likely, not if they had any idea of the value, because we were offering market value for sure. And uh, uh, we didn't, you know, our first offer was a little bit under market value, but we were certainly going to come up to market value. Um, and we probably would, so just, just to give you numbers, we know that the house basically next door, which is twice the size and in a slightly better position in town, rented for $800. We offered 650. Remember, half the size doesn't check our boxes and not quite as good a position as the one that's 800. Um, and the 800 one checked all of our boxes, right? So there's a lot negative for us and there's some just general negative. Um, and from a quality, I would say both houses were very similar. This one was slightly less, but only just the tiniest bit. Overall, both were excellent quality. So we offered 650. Uh, we expected them to take at 700, and if they played hardball, we probably would have gone to 750. We did feel 750 was getting ripped off, but we might have been willing to do it because we did really want to be there. Uh, but 700 is really where we wanted to be and was absolutely a fair price, and we believe slightly over market. 650 felt a little bit under market, so probably in the high 600s is where the house should be, given its size, position, and other things going on in the market but we were absolutely giving them a good deal um, so if the seller had been aware of anything we think they would have jumped on it or at least jumped on negotiations the agent however knows that she can wait years for the market to rebound if we get into the house now we could hold on to it for for years and yes, while our rent may go up over the years, she won't realize any of that. That will simply, she will only get paid for that first time that she rents the house. And if she rents it at 650 or 700, her commission is going to be much lower than if she rents it at 800 or 900 or 1,000 in a year or two. She has a very strong financial incentive to keep that house off the market, but still under her advisement for years, literally years, given what we expect the market to do. So uh, there's a strong incentive for her to take thousands and thousands of dollars out of the pockets of the actual people who own the house because she doesn't get paid well if she represents them well. This is a case where that misalignment could be really dramatic. I don't know that that's what happened, but that is what it seems like happened. And we do know that the other houses she showed us, she was unable to show us any other appropriate houses. And even this one, like I said, it didn't check our boxes, but we were willing, you know, we're a little bit willing to look at houses and, and do some things, but in general, we're not looking to just go out and get anything. And she was the one that showed us places that were nearly $4,000. Our budget was 800. We're really, if we found something absolutely perfect, we would talk about something else, but we want to be around 800 because otherwise we're just spending way more money than we need to. And we have other things we need to do with our money and we only need so much house and we know 800 will get us way more than we need. So that's why we're, that's, that's what our budget is. And we want to be way under it. We want to be in the 600s and 700s are perfectly okay. 800 is the absolute max that we'll reasonably take. Um, and, uh, and she was showing us stuff so far outside of reason and focused on parts of the city we had said, don't want to be in the city. It doesn't make sense. We're willing to look if you find a perfect spot, but we're telling you all the churches, all the, the fireworks, the noise, all that stuff, we, we don't want it because we have dogs and we have kids and I have a studio. I need space. We need quiet. We need room for the dogs. And that's why we're looking. That's what prompted this entire thing. We like the house we're in. We're like the neighborhood we're in. We're like all that stuff. We like how we can walk to downtown. We're moving because it doesn't meet our needs. And, and she was just ignoring us, like completely ignored us. Budget, needs, everything, um, and location. Like, so everything was small and in the center of the city or huge and in the center of the city and not a house. Like, okay, but we're looking for a house. How does, how does a hotel with no space around it in the middle of the city meet our needs for lots of space, house outside the city, right? Like everything backwards um, and, and four to five times the budget. Like just, it was crazy. Um, so in all situations, this is a general business advice for everybody, right? Think about your business partners, anyone you do business with, whether it's an employee, a vendor, a, a contractor, a business partner, how aligned are your desires? How aligned are your needs? How aligned is your uh, agreement? Is, 
Is your success their success, or are you adversarial? And sometimes you have to be adversarial. There's not always a way to be aligned and do the same thing, but in general, there are ways uh, to make sure that, that people who work together are working towards a common good, and when that doesn't exist, you may need to really carefully think about why you're going into that relationship in the first place. If you have a seller's agent who's not aligned with you, why use that seller's agent? Find a different agent or type of mechanism to sell your house. Or, you know, be aware. Oh, I, I want maximum price, and here's the things, and this is, you know, how it's going to work. Or, I'm going to have direct contact with the customers. I'm not going to, uh, you know, for any negotiations. Um, so that way, there's, there's clear communications, and they can't hide these things from me. Like, there's ways to mitigate this, right? And there's no reason not to do that. As long as she's getting paid, she shouldn't care that you're doing half the work. Right, and if she does care, that means that there was something dishonest. She's, something's being hidden because as long as she's going to get paid either way, she, this is to her benefit to to do less work and get the same money or basically the same money. In some cases, more money because you're more, much more likely to close the deal. So, in all cases, this is general cases, right? All business relationships with agents in the U.S., you're used to very strong legal frameworks. Um, that make them work in a certain way and essentially guarantee that you're going to be represented at least moderately well um, it, by by attempt, right? Maybe they do a bad job. Maybe they're just bad at their job. That, could, that Nothing protects against that. But uh, is, they're going to at least try to do the right thing because there's so many mechanisms to protect you as the consumer if they don't, right? If you didn't rent and there was an option and someone found out, there would be legal issues. Here, it's just, oh, now I'm angry because you screwed us over, but there's nothing they can do about it, really. There might be with the new law when that comes into place, but right now, nothing, right? So even seller's agents, be really wary. As the seller, you're easily getting screwed and have no way to know. And as the buyer, be aware that that seller's agent has very little reason to be uh, honestly representing you to the customer and maybe being paid, not intentionally, but accidentally by the customer, by the, by the person that's selling the house, to, uh, to not represent them to you. Um, which hopefully people know better than to do that, but they don't, right? Realistically, people don't think through those things. They see someone, they feel that they have a nice relationship, they're gonna represent them, and maybe they start off that way, and then the, the agent sees dollar signs. Wait, I get paid more if I do this. They're gonna do, and they, and they may even think, well, if I'm making more money, they must be making more money, and not think about the fact, right? They, they may come back and say, like, but I got you a bigger rent. Yeah, but for half the time. Did you give me double the rent? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, that is a problem. Right. There's a lot of calculations that go into these things. You can't just do that. So um, when, when dealing with especially real estate here in Nicaragua, just be so acutely aware. Don't trust that information is being relayed. Don't trust that the information you're getting is accurate. Don't trust that the relationship is a good one. Make sure you Either are just you know these things and are prepared to live with the ramifications. Well, I tried to rent that place. I didn't care. I rented a different one. Okay, maybe that's fine. Um, or this is my dream house. I want to make sure I get it. Make sure you have that line of communications open. Um, don't let someone say they're representing everyone and uh, and not m not ensure that you have some way to verify that that is true. And all of that, this experience has led me to say I think what we need in this country is, and honestly, something like Zillow, right? But a service, I really wish Zillow would just come in, first of all. Zillow, please, come on. But Zillow's doing terrible now. They're not going to move in here. And this is a challenging market. What we need is a service that has a flat fee that's not very high, that goes in and lists houses, takes pictures, provides the contact information of whoever the seller has as an agent. It could be themselves, their son, a seller's agent, right? It would work with existing agencies for people who want to do that or agencies who want to use it. Um, it would post pictures of the houses, locations of the houses, information like so many bedrooms, whatever, the price, the asking prices, the actual thing from the sellers, not from the agents, um, and nothing else, right? No recommendations, no, and maybe, maybe offer tours, right? An important thing that sellers, the sellers agents do at least they're supposed to do in normal cases, is they get the keys and they go and they take people around to show them houses, right? I would like to go see this house. Oh, yes, this is my seller's agent, has my keys, so I don't have to be there when you look at the house. Perfect, that's a great part of the service, an important thing. That doesn't have to be an agent. That could be just a security service that lets you in. You can't ask them questions, but should you? No, you don't want to ask the seller's agent too many questions anyway. You kind of want to just look around. There are things you want to know, but you... 
you can ask those in an email, right? Like there's other ways you can do that. You don't have to be standing in the house talking about it. Um, and often when you're looking at a house, you want to be able to walk around and just talk about it, right? Oh, I could use this room as a library. That would be excellent. Ooh, they're going to spend more because they could put it in the library, right? You don't want that. You just want a security guard who ensures that no one's stealing anything, that no one touches anything and lets you in and lets you walk around. That's the perfect thing. A service that does none of the agentry, none of the brokerage, none of that stuff. Doesn't tell you which houses to look at, doesn't doesn't recommend things, doesn't negotiate, doesn't communicate, nothing. Just a website that lists information so that you have the ability at an extremely low cost for people who have houses for sale or rent to share that information with the world in a uniform fashion so that people can find it. That's what is needed. Um, everything else, you know, do you need agents? You should, like the, the agent system in the US and Canada, it mostly works but you need some mechanisms around it, but they need a system like this too. And of course you can say, well, that's what an MLS is for. And um, MLSs don't work under certain frameworks. And here we don't have the framework that makes an MLS work. In the United States, every bot purchase and sale is registered in a very uniform way that a system can pull that out of. So you have this mechanism um, and, and this huge framework that more or less makes it work. And in the US, I would say one of the things that makes me not want to ever do real estate in the US is the MLS system there because it is private, it is not public, um, and it doesn't operate for the good of the people with the houses. It operates for a private, non standard uh, agents network, right? There is a, um, it's, it's a cabal, basically, it's kind of like a union. Um, and they're called real tours, not realtors. People say it's not realtor, it's real tour. An actual real estate agent is a realtor. Real tour means you're a union or cabal member of this one that has access to the MLS or has the right to access the MLS. The MLSs in the US, um, first of all, are not as complete as the Zillows and, and um, uh, Trulias of the world. Those actually have the better information. Um, the MLSs are uh, useful only because there is this monopoly that controls the US market, but you don't want a monopoly, you want capitalism, right? That is a situation where the, the very, very, I hate to say it, but the very communist nature of the United States where single government aligned giant secret co corporations, because that's what it is, own the entire mechanism of the market and control the pricing and the visibility and the uh, ability to be an agent. Legally, you can be an agent without being a realtor, but functionally you can't because ever the reason to become a realtor is to become a realtor because that gives you the access to this private company's monopoly information on the market. That is exactly what every other country in the world wants to avoid at all costs because it completely screws over their country and just gives all the money to some private corporation. Um, if you're gonna have something like that legitimately, it should be run by the government. And if you're gonna have something like that that isn't run by the government, then you don't want it quite like that. You don't actually want an MLS, you want a something more like a Zillow, where they're just collecting every bit of information that they can and informing people as best they can without getting in the path. Assuming that the government here is not gonna step in and take over an industry, and, and most anywhere, then it's something more like a Zillow that is what is needed to make a difference. That is my opinion on it. Having thought about it quite a bit because I am someone who deals with buying and selling houses here for myself, and it is a huge problem. I have seen so much, so much in so and every single person I talk to has either, oh, I was protected because I had a local who did all the stuff and like, oh my gosh, I'm so safe, but all my neighbors got completely screwed in the exact same, like buying in the same spot. They paid four times, I just, this is just posted, it's public, right? One of my viewers just, uh, or just, sometime recently built a house, all of his neighbors paid four times what he did, right? Because they went through the agents and they went through their people, right? Each of the pieces was so much more expensive. And they all thought it was reasonable because they talked to each other. But as soon as you didn't go through that mechanism, you could build in the same complex or in the same spot, quarter of the price, quarter of the price. So think about those things. It's, it's very, very different. Um, uh, and that's just every story is the same. Oh my gosh, I almost, I see where they were going to get me or they got me. I lost so much money. Now I'm trapped. Now I have a place I can't unload because I have so much money into it and it's not worth it. Whatever. Everybody has those stories. Um, and be aware, when you talk to people, there's a lot of people who will tell you, I got screwed, I almost got screwed, I saved myself, I, I backed out at the last second, but there's a lot of people who get caught and they get screwed and now they're holding very expensive property and they dare not either emotionally expose their mistake because it just hurts or 
they don't understand their mistake because they're they're lying to themselves. Well, all my neighbors paid the same, so I must be I must have gotten a good deal, right? I was told it was a good deal. I'm not gonna I'm not I'm gonna put my fingers in my ears and no 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 don't tell me that I, you know that the one next door to me was a quarter of the price. You have those people, and then you have the people who simply know that if they don't play along claiming the high prices, that they'll never be able to sell their house, and they're just hoping to find someone else who falls for the same thing so they can unload it. So a lot of people who've unfortunately fallen for these tactics will repeat that they think they got a good deal and recommend the people that they used because they're just hoping that it somehow protects themselves. Um, but in many cases, it's just an emotional reaction. People hate having made a mistake, We've all made mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes. I have screwed myself over plenty of times in the past. Um, I've gotten lucky many times, and it was not my smartness that protected me. It was luck. Um, it's just how it is. But when we make big mistakes, we tend to want to cover them up. We want to lie about it, even to ourselves. We're just we, Our brains don't like knowing we didn't do something well, and uh, we tend to freak out. So be aware when you get, and this is true for everything, right? I talk to businesses about this. Remember, I'm a business consultant. This is the stuff I do. When we talk to businesses, we're like, when you get positive reviews, you have to take them with a grain of salt. When it's your buddy and he can have a lengthy conversation about why something is good, a vendor is good, a product is good, and can really dig into it, that may have value when you trust that person and you can query them. But even casual, did they do a good job? Yeah, they seem to do a good job. Ask what that means, really dig into it. But when you get bad reviews, you tend to have a lot more honesty because when something goes wrong, people are acutely aware. Well, I know something went wrong. Okay, talk to them. What went wrong? What happened? What, what made you think it was the vendor that did it? Sorry, it died. We ate through an entire battery in doing that one video. I think it actually overheated and uh, kind of killed itself. I don't know. It suddenly, it suddenly disappeared. I'm getting some weird light here, at least on the screen. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I don't know. Yeah, right there. What is that? Why is it only here? I guess. Oh, it must be my hat. Okay. So uh, anyway, the moral of the story of all that is make sure you are business aligned and pay attention and uh, don't get caught unaware because you are working with people who are not working for you. Uh, so at the end of the day, we gave the whole day and our plan is we need to do one more walkthrough of the house in Sutiava. But remember, we did look at it and we said it checked all of our boxes. We just kind of favored the house in Fatima. But of course, once we made that decision, of course, we were that's the way we were going. Um, but the kids have not seen the one in Sutiava yet, so our plan is to go see it uh, possibly tomorrow um, and uh, make a final decision once they've seen it. We want to make sure that they're going to be happy with it because we want to stay in a house for a while. We don't want to be switching all the time. Um, this first one in Leon was not even meant to be our house in Leon. We thought we were just getting an apartment in Leon for part time, and then it turned into our main house because we wanted to be in Leon all the time. Um, now we want to be in Leon a little bit less, but still a lot. Um, and there's just a lot of factors have changed. And this was not intentional and we just kind of fell into it. So it's been a kind of a weird situation. It was not well adapted for our needs because it was never meant to have the dogs, for example. So we're fixing all of that now. So hopefully the house in Sutiyava, which we already have a price on, which is closer to reality, not a lot closer, but a bit closer um, as a starting point, uh, we will know soon. So that is the plan probably for tomorrow. We will find out. And uh, other than that, we're going to go do the throwback in just a minute. But first, please remember to like and subscribe. Leave your comments below. Ask your questions. Definitely real estate stuff. There's so much to ask. I'm going to tell you right now, if you ask me, but what about this agent? No. But isn't in this case? No. Your buyer's agent does not make sense for you. They just don't, right? There's things you need. That's not it. Um, and so feel free to ask, but that's what the answer is going to be. You already know the answer. So by asking it again, it's not going to change it. Um, and uh, uh, if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee. There's a link for that down in the description. Stay and go watch the throwback episodes. Those are interesting, especially now, because three years ago, the throwbacks that we're doing, we were here in Nicaragua, so they're really special. And uh, uh, today is the second. So the throwback for today is actually the day that we landed in Nicaragua. Actually, I'm not even going to go watch that one. I'm going to do the throwback right now, continuous. I have not seen that episode in a long time, so I'm going to watch that one later after I've uh, recorded this because I remember that day so well. So yesterday on November 1st, we missed our flight uh, because, not because we didn't miss it, it was canceled um, on Spirit to go to Nicaragua. So our trip has gotten a day shorter because it's not like we have another day to make up somewhere. So today, Alan and Tini uh, are staying at a hotel near the airport. Rachel and I are hanging out at our respective homes. It kind of worked out for Rachel because it gave her some time to get moved into her apartment because if you watch the throwback episodes, we had just moved her in. And, um, 
uh, and it gave me a little bit of time to just get more work done and stuff, but we're missing time in Nicaragua. We were not happy. So today we spent the whole day hoping we got onto a flight and we did eventually get onto a flight, flew to Fort Lauderdale. Everything went fine, flew on to Managua, got to Managua pretty late. I don't know the exact times, that'll be in the throwback. And then we took a taxi van from just for us with our, all of our luggage from Managua straight down to San Juan del Sur. Now this is Rachel's first time in Nicaragua, Alan and Tini's first time outside of the country, and my first time spending time in San Juan del Sur. We had spent time in a town um, just outside San Juan del Sur a number of years ago with the girls. First time I ever encountered a scorpion in, in real life. And that was 2015. So that was at four years ago from the time that we were going now and and seven years ago from the time I'm recording this throwback and if you thought my stuff was confusing before um, and uh, so this was a really big deal but we arrived in the dark so nobody got to see any of it it just lights flashing past in the darkness so it's kind of like okay super boring everybody just kind of napped in the van we stopped in Rivas and picked up beer and snacks uh, and this is Rachel's first time encountering Tonya that she fell in love with and Ranchitos, her new favorite thing. So she and I were just having chips and beer in the van and then at the hotel. We were so happy. <coughs> uh, that was, it was like, oh, great to be abroad again. She and I have not traveled together in a number of years. We lived together in Spain um, and then traveled to Africa together. But this is the first uh, that we've gone somewhere new in, in four years. So that was a really big deal. Uh, and uh, we got into San Juan del Sur. It's my, I've only driven through the village proper in the past, so I don't know my way around or anything. And we went to the Hotel of the Barrio Cafe. Sadly, now, three years later, Barrio Cafe closed there, and the hotel, I guess, is still open. It's part of Ical. Uh, the Barrio Cafe still exists here in Managua, so you can go eat most of the same food, uh, but it was a fantastic venue with their, their menu and everything back in the day, back in, in 2019. So we got in, checked into the hotel. There's just a security guard waiting outside. He let us in. Ellen and Tini straight into bed. Rachel and I got in, ate a few of our snacks, and we're like, we're not going to bed. We're going to see the town. We took our beers, we took our Tonyas, because they were cans, and walked out. And the security guard's like, be careful over here and that and whatever. And then we spent three hours, I'm pretty sure, just walking the town like crazy in the middle of the night. Everything was closed, of course. There's like a bar here and there open. There's a little bit of light. It was essentially all closed. It was very late. Um, and and we just walked and walked and walked. This turned out to be one of the best things because for the rest of the, the upcoming time in San Juan del Sur, we knew our way around. We knew the lay of the land. We knew where everything was because we had done this. We'd be like, oh, we saw a restaurant that looked good. We saw a bar that looked good. We, we know how to get from here to there because when there was no traffic, no people, we had just wandered town and we had so much fun. It was such a good walk and, and we got to just hang out, the two of us, and do something different. It was, it was such a great time and so glad that we did it. Of course, we're not gonna have very much sleep for tomorrow, but we're so psyched to be in Nicaragua, her first time in Latin America ever, and my first time, uh, she may have been to Mexico, her first time in in Central America, for sure. And uh, my you know, first time back in many years, uh, it was the whole thing great to be back. On this particular trip, as we took the ride from the airport, um, we had to, to go through, like all through Tipi Tapa and near Granada, like down the Messiah Road, all that stuff so many memories. I knew exactly where I was the whole time. And I'm like, oh, I remember being here. Oh, I have so many memories from this place and that place. It's really cool coming back um, and being so close to where we were before because we lived in Granada. And uh, uh, just gonna be the start of a great trip. And we know now three years later, obviously, really important trip that uh, triggered us moving, not just a little bit, but completely back to Nicaragua. Thanks for joining me. Do all the stuff, do the things, share on social media, let people know about the show. I really appreciate everyone joining, and sorry if I lost a thought mid-battery. Sometimes that happens, uh, but it's great all the support we have on the show. I will see all of you tomorrow.